This video is part one of chapter eight, which introduces us to metabolism. We've already talked about how living cells have all kinds of chemical reactions occurring in them. Well, energy is a huge part of this, and the cell must get energy from outside sources in order to carry out these chemical reactions. So what the cell does is it extracts energy from sugars and applies them, applies that energy to perform work, which could be a variety of things. We call these chemical reactions metabolism, and metabolism is what we would consider to be the total of an organism's chemical reactions. It is an emergent property of life, and it arises from a variety of interactions between molecules. Metabolism is divided into metabolic pathways, which are reactions that have a variety of steps. They each start with a particular reactant and end with a particular product, and each step along the way is catalyzed or facilitated by a specific enzyme. Here's an example of a basic metabolic pathway. The pathway starts with A, as an example, as the reactant. Enzyme 1 facilitates the first reaction, which converts A to B. Enzyme 2 facilitates the second reaction, which converts B to C, and C is converted to D by enzyme in a third reaction. <coughs> pathways that release energy by breaking down molecules are called catabolic pathways. One of the main pathways in your cells is called cellular respiration, and it is a catabolic pathway that breaks down glucose. <coughs> by contrast, anabolic pathways consume energy and build complex molecules from simpler ones. So when your body builds proteins, for example, that's, a com that's an example of anabolism or an anabolic pathway. Catabolic pathways provide the energy for the anabolic pathway. So put another way, catabolic pathways fuel anabolic pathways. So they're very closely related. The study of how all this works is called bioenergetics, and which is really the study of how energy flows through a living organism. Now let's talk about energy a little bit. We brought it up, but we haven't really mentioned what it is. Energy is the capacity to cause change, meaning the capacity to make something happen inside of a cell or you know, in a chemical reaction or wherever. And energy can exist in a variety of forms. Some of this energy can perform work, which is things like chemical reactions, motion, stuff like that inside of a cell. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a few minutes here in this video. One type of energy is kinetic energy, and that is the energy associated with motion. So when something is moving, it has kinetic energy. Another form of energy is heat, which is the kinetic energy associated with the random movement of atoms or molecules in an environment. Potential energy is the energy that matter possesses because of its location or structure. So for example, a ball sitting at the top of a hill has potential energy. Once that ball is pushed down the hill, that potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. <coughs> chemical energy is a type of potential energy which is avail available for release in a chemical reaction. So for example, sh a sugar molecule has chemical energy because it can be broken down to release that energy. And basically what we've been saying throughout this slide is that energy can be converted from one form to another. There are laws that govern this conversion or transformation, and these laws are related to what we call thermodynamics, which is the study of energy transformation. We talk about thermodynamics in terms of systems. An isolated system is one in which there is no energy exchange between the matter inside the system and the surroundings. These are very rare. Open systems, on the other hand, are those in which energy and matter are transferred between the system and its environment. The living cell and any living organism would be considered an open system. There are two laws of thermodynamics. The first law is that the energy of the universe is constant. It's also called the, the principle or the law of conservation of energy. And what the first law of thermodynamics states is that energy be, can, can be transferred or transformed, but it's never created nor destroyed. So new energy is never created and energy is never truly destroyed. <clears throat> the second law of thermodynamics discusses these energy transformations and that they are inefficient. So when one form of energy is transformed to another, heat is released. Now, 
the slide says that heat is lost. That's kind of a misconception. It's not really lost, but it's released into the system. So if you took all the energy from a molecule and converted it to something else, let's say you broke it down, all the energy that resulted from that breakdown would still be equal to the energy that was found in the molecule in the first place. But this release of heat um, is based on randomness of these energy transformation. And so when energy is transformed in from one form to another, this release of heat increases what we call the entropy of the system or the universe. And entropy is just disorder. <clears throat> Another concept we need to understand is the concept of free energy. And we're not going to go into a lot of detail on this, so you only need to know the basics of this. Free energy is the energy found in a system that allows chemical reactions to occur. So for example, your body temperature provides free energy or ener available energy for chemical reactions to occur inside your cells. Okay? So this free energy could also be defined as the energy that can do work in a cell. Now this is when the temperature and pressure are uniform. So your body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius and it's maintained that way. That would be considered the free energy available for your cells to use to perform chemical reactions. We can apply this concept of free energy to life's processes as we've already mentioned. So free energy is available for metabolic pathways to occur. And there are two basic kinds of reactions that we can subdivide out from metabolism. An exergonic reaction is one that proceeds with a net release of free energy and is spontaneous. So what that means is exergonic reactions only need available free energy to occur. They don't need an extra energy input. Endergonic reactions, on the other hand, require an excess energy input in order to occur, and therefore they are non-spontaneous. We could compare exergonic reactions to catabolic reactions and endergonic reactions to anabolic reactions. If we look at this on a graph, Here's an exergonic reaction. The reactants possess a lot of energy, but there's enough energy in the system for the reaction to occur on its own. When the reactants are converted to products, there's an energy release, and the, the amount of energy released comes out of the reactants, and so therefore the products have a lower energy value or energy content. By contrast, reactants in an endergonic reaction require excess energy, and the products, therefore, contain more energy than the reactants do. Cellular work is powered by a molecule called ATP. And there are three main kinds of work that a cell carries out. Chemical, in terms of chemical reactions. Transport, which uh, includes stuff like the sodium-potassium pump, which we learned about before, meaning movement of things into and out of the cell. And then mechanical, which includes stuff like muscle contraction. To do these works, cells must manage their energy resources by coupling reactions together. That is to say, the use of exergonic processes to drive endergonic processes. It's very similar to catabolic processes driving anabolic processes. Most of this energy coupling is med mediated by the molecule ATP. <coughs> ATP is a nucleotide, and it's otherwise known as adenosine triphosphate and it is really the fuel of the, shell, the cell, or what we could call the cell's energy shuttle. It's composed of three molecules, a sugar, a nitrogenous base, and three phosphates. We've seen a similar structure to this before in nucleic acids. But it's a little bit different because ATP has three phosphates on one end rather than the single phosphate that other nucleotides have. It's this phosphate tail, as we refer to it, that possesses the energy in an ATP molecule. And it's the hydrolysis of ATP that releases energy for cells to use for various types of work. When the bonds between the second and third phosphate group are broken, this is the hydrolysis of ATP. And this hydrolysis releases energy that can be used to fuel cellular work, as I mentioned a second ago. So how does this hydrolysis perform work? Well, we've already talked about the three types of work and that they're powered by ATP hydrolysis. Basically what happens, as we said, was that the energy is released from this ATP molecule when the third phosphate is, is broken off of the molecule. 
what happens then is that this phosphate is transferred to other molecules and this is really the energy transfer that occurs when ATP is, hy is hydrolyzed or goes through hydrolysis. We call this process phosphorylation because it's the transfer of a phosphate from one molecule to the next, in this case from ATP to another molecule. So if we look at a basic example of that down here, let's say we have an amino acid and it's going to be energized. That ATP, or well, if we're going to add another molecule to it, ATP can drive that. So the energy is removed from the ATP, it's used to bind these two molecules together, and then we get a release of, a, of an adenosine diphosphate, which is the hydrolyzed version of ATP, and a single phosphate molecule itself. This is the hydrolysis of ATP. Now, ATP is actually a renewable resource inside of a cell. Every time it's broken down, it can be put back together using other energy inputs. So ATP is basically recycled inside the cell. This is good because it's expensive to build new ATP molecules or new ADP molecules from scratch, and it's hard for the cell to do that. So ATP is actually regenerated. Here's what that looks like. So energy from catabolic processes is used to put ADP and phosphate back together to form ATP. When ATP is hydrolyzed or goes through hydrolysis, that energy is released for endergonic processes. So it's basically a cycle.